Hello and welcome to the Vedic Conversation, where each episode we take a different topic and look at it through the lens of storytelling and from the perspective of the Veda, an ancient but very much still relevant body of knowledge from India. I'm Anthony Thompson, a Vedic meditation teacher based in London, and I'm joined by my Vedic colleagues Derek Yanford in New York and Rory Kinsella in Sydney. This episode was recorded in the middle of June, and we're talking about perception. We look at how, when we're able to clear our perceptual filters, we're able to see things more clearly. But first, sit back and listen to our stories, and then we'll dive into the conversation. As always, don't forget to stick around until the end, where we'll offer a practical exercise in how you can apply this knowledge in your daily life. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Before I began my formal dance training, I used to enter talent shows as a soloist, most of which I created on my own, yet influenced by other dancers I looked up to who had strong technical training. I remember becoming frustrated when I wasn't able to execute certain moves, and even more so when I couldn't remember the choreography. Now these feelings would often get the best of me, especially the closer it got to showtime. Filled with self-doubt, I began to believe that I wasn't any good and that I should just give up. Although I had desire, what I lacked was an accurate perception of my capabilities. I was holding myself to unrealistic standards and my perception needed to be calibrated. Perception is the ability or process of becoming aware of that which is experienced through our senses and selecting, organizing, and interpreting that information. Our perception gives us a greater understanding of what's going on in and around us. And in my case, it was faulty perception at play. Once I made the choice to enroll in a dance studio and began training regularly, my perception undertook a major shift. I wasn't so hard on myself as I started to have a better understanding of the process and how much work goes into perfecting certain moves. What appears as effortless dancing is actually the result of hours of training where you are constantly making and learning from your mistakes. The body and the mind need time to incorporate the new skills before they can, be, they can become second nature. And the only way there is through constant practice. And the more I trained, the more my perception changed and I began to believe more strongly in my abilities as I was more accurately in tune with my progress. Now this is a great way to understand how our perception changes with consistent practice of twice a day meditation and why we start living better lives because of it. Now before starting a meditation practice, you may have a particular view or perception of the world, your role, and the purpose of life itself. And coupled with a high sense of individuality perpetuated by the ego, it can become easy to adopt a viewpoint of struggle, suffering, and malcontent. And a search for lasting happiness and a more friction-free lifestyle may seem to exist only as a dream. Meditation helps to make this our reality, assisting us in uncovering the truth of who we are. When we meditate, the body rests deeply transcends thought and allows us to have contact with the source of our being, pure consciousness or pure awareness. And each time we engage in meditation and have this experience, our own awareness and truth of our being begins to grow and stabilizes with consistent practice. Now the Vedas tell us this is our truth, that we are one, not individuals, not separate or other, but rather we are simply individual expressions of one thing, just sequenced a bit differently, creating the illusion of other. And as you realize this truth, you realize all that you are searching for resides within you as you are actually that 
what you are seeking. It's this false viewpoint of separation that leads to having a scarcity mindset where your perception becomes distorted with the idea that there is not enough, that you are lacking, much like the way I falsely perceived myself as not being good enough, that I lacked ability. It was through constant practice that I was able to realize my potential. Now, perception and awareness go hand in hand, and as one augments, so does the other. And if you believe that your life can be easier than the one you're currently living, and that there is more to you than you are accessing, then take this as a signal to begin meditating. Now, the important thing to remember is that we are works in progress. This realization is not an overnight phenomenon, especially after years of practicing, defending, and believing in the illusion of other. Like any other journey, it begins with the first step, but don't take my word for it. I invite you to discover the truth of who you are and see for yourself. I've recently been rereading my journal, which I've been keeping pretty consistently for about the last eight years. I started it about two years before I learned to meditate and I've been going for about six years since. And it's been really fascinating to see how my perception of myself and of the things that have happened in my life has changed over the years. And there's been a really noticeable difference in what I was like before and after and how I thought about things before and after. So my diary starts in late 2012 when I was at the beginning of what I call my early midlife crisis. And I'd started to realize that some of my behaviors and ways of thinking were no longer sustainable, but I didn't yet know how to change them. But I had started running, which was making me feel really good, and I'd started journaling. And awareness is almost always the first step in any change. And when I was reading the journal last week, I was shocked at how hard I was on myself. In every area of my life, I was really ripping into myself for things I'd done wrong or should have known or should have done better or differently. And there was lots of, the, lots of use of the word should for a start. At work, I'd be worrying about my performance or how I was doing in different aspects of my job. And when something went wrong, I would take it really personally. If there were disagreements, I'd set people up in my head as the, the enemy or my nemesis. And I'd build up these big rivalries over things that were no more than differences of perspective or opinion. And in my social life, I was drinking and partying pretty hard at this point, and I'd berate myself for the states that I'd get into, and I'd add in lots of guilt to my already frail hungover states, which didn't help at all. And I'd often get pointlessly paranoid about stuff. I'd take an offhand comment that someone made on a night out and turn it into this big thing in my head and start doubting these key aspects of my identity. It was really quite crazy. But then after I learned to meditate, a lot of this drama seemed to, seems to fall out of the journal almost completely. My way of viewing things before had been pretty self-absorbed and fragile. And my egocentric way of seeing things meant that my sense of well-being was at the mercy of external events and what people thought of me. Any criticism or outward failure would hit me hard. But afterwards, I became more inner-directed in terms of my fulfillment. Life still went on with its ups and downs, its successes and its failures, but I didn't take things so personally. At work, I adopted a new motto. There's no there's no failure, only feedback of information. And if things went wrong, I wasn't necessarily to blame, and I also didn't have to apportion blame on anyone else, including my former, former enemies. I was much more able to take the position that everyone was acting from good intentions, but the unforeseen things just happen sometimes, and that no one can predict the future. And from the Vedic perspective, I would describe it as my perception having widened. Rather than being closely focused on myself and the small me, my ego and my particular role in things, I was much more able to see the bigger picture. 
I was able to widen the lens and take in more concept uh, and take in more context uh, to see the wider lay of the land. And rather than being lost in my own rivalries and my own personal triumphs and failures, I was more able to see things in their proper context and not get worked up by them. I was able to achieve much, a much more level sense of well-being rather than being on this ego-driven roller coaster. And my behaviors changed, not necessarily overnight, but gradually. If I didn't want to drink on a night out, I'd be confident enough to stick to my guns, even if my friends were trying to twist my arm. And I drank less and I had fewer sorrows to drown, you could say. And I treated people better in relationships and the language of the journal changes completely. There's much less of the language of necessity where I'd say things like I should be doing such and such or I must be doing such and such. And it started to change to the language of possibility. I can do this or I can do that. And then on to the language of choice. I want to do this. I don't want to do this. I choose to do this. And I stopped trying to control everything, which is always a futile effort. Life started to flow a lot more easily. The Beatles had returned from India, and it was the hot summer before I went to secondary school. A friend who was up to speed on all the latest music asked me to join him to hear a new album he'd bought. It was the first album by The Doors. A few years later, I learned they took their name from The Doors of Perception, a book written by Aldous Huxley in 1954. I had no real understanding of what perception meant until after I'd started to meditate about 18 months later. But I was taught a lesson in the first week of my job working at an international auction house. The head of security had given us a talk about being vigilant, looking out for anything that seemed untoward and which would threaten the safety of the very valuable artwork that was in the building. A day or so later, I noticed a suspicious character, a small elderly lady wearing a dirty raincoat, bent over carrying bulging heavy bags. She looked very out of place and her behaviour was erratic. So I approached a security guard and told him what I'd seen. He pulled me to one side and laughingly said, Oh, that's Mrs. Wise. She's an important silver dealer and is often in here. My perception, my understanding of the person I had seen had been influenced by the request to be security conscious. So often the way we view things, and especially people, is through a prism which has been defined by our culture and upbringing, or influenced by something we've been told or learned. I had misinterpreted something that didn't look right, and my sense of foolishness was compounded by the knowledge that my fine levels of feeling had been tempered by the instruction to be vigilant. On a very simple level, I had been conditioned. Right now, with the George Floyd and Black Lives Matter protests, we can see perception thrown into sharp focus that many years, many generations of conditioning and mass hypnosis in the collective is no longer to be tolerated or is sustainable. Vedic meditation finesses our perception and acuity, the keenness or sharpness of perception, so that whatever we approach or come across is understood at all levels. The Vedas show us that when we're in our most simple and honest state, in full consciousness, the purity and integrity of what we're engaging with is shown to have the absence of other. It is no different to us. And this allows us to connect, contribute, and grow. By adjusting the optic, we can change the way we observe, the way we assimilate, the way we sense and recognize and understand that something is right or wrong. Vedic meditation helps us see more clearly, improving our judgment and insight leading to better decisions. We're able to see the truth more clearly from a position of honesty. Many years after I first heard how the doors chose their name, I learned that Aldous Huxley in turn took his title from the visionary work The Marriage of Heaven and Hell by the English poet and artist William Blake, who wrote, If the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is, infinite. Do 
Did you find this an easy subject to um, pull together? Um, this is probably the one that was the most abstract sounding. So we took the word perception, right? And I was like, oh, you could just, you could, you could interpret it lots of different ways. But I think in the end, we all kind of came to something quite similar. But the first thing I thought of, interestingly, Anthony, was I thought of the tools of perception as well. Because um, in, my, in my teens, I, I, re you know, I read the Huxley book. I love that whole kind of drug experience thing. Because he takes, is it mescaline he takes in the, in the book? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so so Derek, I don't know if you've read it, but yeah, Al Aldous Huxley, who was a, an English novelist, did this very kind of literary description of a drug experience. What was it? Maybe in the 50s, did you say? Uh, 1953, I think it was. And he just sits, I think he's looking at a chair or a table or something like that, and he, he just does this amazing description of how he sees into the kind of living being of this of this table or chair, I can't remember what it is, or a shoe or something like that. Um, and it just shows how something really mundane, if you've got the right level of perception, can open up this whole... Or another one, he looks at a flower and he just sees this beauty coming out of the flower. And I guess that ties into, I guess, drug experience and, and meditation experience are kind of on the same... Um, spectrum because drug experience is a way of um hijacking your way into these experiences whereas meditation is more of a slow burn but yeah i'm glad you talked talked about the doors and <laughs> all this huxley because that was that was exactly what um i thought of so so you were around at, at that time i guess anthony when the doors not, were in, not, not <laughs> in 54 <laughs> <laughs> like it. No, in um, in '67, <laughs> yeah, when the Doors produced their first album. I mean, for me, it was like it was the most exciting thing I'd heard because you know before that it was kind of the Stones and and um, you know the Beatles, and here were these guys from LA really doing something radical. The sound of the music was great, and Jim Morrison was just kind of a wild child, um, you know, probably quite quite smashed out of his mind most of the time, and it was it was just great, you know. I mean. Um, I used to, you know, I was I was a huge fan. I was a huge fan. Um, yeah, but it's, I think that Aldous Huxley's account of that trip is probably the best and most descriptive and most uh, profound account of a trip. And I, I, I think his wife and the doctor who gave him the mescaline were kind of around. I mean, they weren't tripping with him, but he just wanted them to be around to be sure that he was going to be safe. Um, and of course, it's fascinating when you then think how Timothy Leary and Ram Dass and that whole, you know, the LSD um, movement kind of took off, you know, base really about sort of almost, yeah, 12 years later. Um, and it's astonishing to think that LSD was legal uh, in the States. Uh, and in Vietnam, troops were given LSD um, to help them cope. And my dad, when he was in North Africa in the Second World War, they were given him amphetamines as a way of just getting through the hunger because the food supplies were, were, were bad, um, keeping them awake. Um, I mean, it must have just devastated their systems. Like I kind of thought about like the the first time you see somebody or you have an impression of a person, and they say that you can never make a, a second chance to make a first impression, and the state of consciousness that you're in when you meet somebody, and all these things that you think about them, you know, and then later on you get to know them a little bit better, and because your perception and your awareness of who they are completely changes. And it made me kind of think about, as I was listening to both of your stories, like the one time, maybe I don't read a lot, but the one time in school, I remember reading Ways of Seeing, I think by John Berger. And there is like a picture of, of Van Gogh on one of the pages that says it's something like, 
they, this is a picture of crows above a cornfield. And you're like, oh, wow, that's beautiful. It's great. You know, and then you flip the page and it says, this is the last thing that Van Gogh painted before he killed himself. And you're like, whoa, you know, how, you know, you're seeing exactly the same image, but how much your perception of it changes by what was told to you or what it was read right prior to you having that experience. You know what I mean? And it was just like, I mean, with Rory, when you were talking about journaling and writing in your journal and then looking back and how your perception of what you were writing was so different, just, you know, same kind of thing. To me, that book kind of came up. And then Anthony, when you were talking about, you know, the woman, <laughs> how you had kind of been flipped into the security consciousness and how you had seen her. And it was like, yeah, there's so, there's so much going on in terms of perception, largely, you know, maybe subconsciously that we're not aware of, but, you know, through meditation, how have a much larger awareness now. And I think the thing that's really changed for me is being able to perceive how other people are perceiving you or the situation that's going on. And, uh, you know, like, I was also thinking about how if, as a young kid, I took myself very, very seriously. And I know that my, my friends used to like to play jokes and stuff and I would get really upset because I, I would want to control everything. And I think I just had a lack of perception that they were just having fun, you know? Everybody was just having a good time. And now that I'm older and I can step back and not take myself so seriously, I can engage in life in a much more pleasant, playful manner because it's not like I'm not trying to control everything. And that's, you know, a hundred percent I can attribute that to our meditation practice. I think that's a really important interesting point you make, Derek, about this kind of childlike delight. You know, um, you know, when you look at little children, they're not really conditioned. I mean, you know, they're just whatever they're interested in and charmed by, they're interested and charmed by. And it's not until I think you get to about the age of six or seven that you're taking on board information that other people have been telling you about other people or situations like, you know, dogs might bite or, you know. Um, and I think you're right. You know, a lot of the way we perceive things is very subtly controlled by conditioning. Um, which starts at a very, very early age. I think, one of, for me, one of the most fascinating things that's happened over the last 20 years is, you know, learning not to be judgmental and just to take everything at face value and work on the basis that, until proved otherwise, this is okay. Mm. You are okay. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and it's actually liberating. It's immensely liberating when, when you get to that point because you're not really, I mean, you know, I, I've still got a long way to go. I mean, when I still trip myself up, but it's a lot better than it was. And, um, you know, it's this open heartedness. It's this um, facility of just being tolerant and accepting and I think I think that's that I see that a lot with with people who are learning to meditate that they there's a, a great deal more acceptance of themselves that they they start to understand how they're working and that it's okay you know that in a sense they they reacquaint themselves with themselves mm. and then you're getting onto this interesting path of being honest. And, you know, the meditation is perhaps a form of introspection, looking at things that need to be addressed in a gentle and compassionate and gracious way. And, you know, the more, more meditation you do, the, the, the easier that all becomes. And it just all melts away and just becomes straightforward. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's what it felt like for me <clears throat> reading those journals. And I'm so glad that I started it a year, two years before I started meditating, which is which is, you know, it's a kind of weird coincidence that I've managed to get this, this good chunk of the writing before 
And like I, I mentioned in my story, like I'm beating myself up the whole time. And it's just like, when I'm reading, I'm like, poor, poor guy, just like chill out. Cause it's like problems at work and problems in social life. And, and I'd, I mean, part of it is that I was doing things which weren't helping my mental state. Like I was drinking a lot and I was in lots of short relationships and then I would add in lots of guilt about that because I guess at some point I knew that I shouldn't be living my life that way. But like you said, Anthony, there's when you start meditating, you start becoming more gentle on yourself. And, you know, that's something that we build into the practice is like, you know, when you forget thinking the mantra, you kind of just shrug and come back to it because you realize that, you know, there are bumps in the road and, you know, you didn't build the road. Um, and how after after I learned to meditate there's still stuff went wrong you know stuff would go wrong at work but rather than being like oh my god I can't believe I've done this you know I would take responsibility for everything and I would take blame for things or I would apportion blame to other people and go I can't believe that person it was always kind of looking for fault whereas like you say Anthony you get to this point where you go okay my default position is going to be more like I believe, you know, everything's going as it should be. I believe people are working from good intentions. I believe that whatever happens will happen for the best reason, even though it doesn't seem like it will in, at the time. And, yeah, I, I, it's kind of like it's, it's reducing suffering is, is a really basic way of thinking about it. That's kind of hard <laughs> Uh, a non a very abstract way of discussing it but you know that if you look at buddhism buddhism is about you know reducing suffering and that's something that we we see in all different traditions and it sounds like a bit of an airy fairy religious concept but in reality it means that you you have a much nicer time of it and you're not getting into uh, kerfuffles at work and you're not beating yourself up about stuff and you're not spending weekends just of guilt and shame you're just living this much more enjoyable life and I guess as a reader it goes from this high drama of all this stuff happening to then I'm just going oh I was walking on the beach with no shoes on and looking at the stars and you know being much more of the the 1960s doors hippie thing which is not as interesting reading um as a reader because you know everyone loves the drama but do we want to live our lives for the drama of other people or for our own enjoyment. You know, I think that's one of the other things about giving up drinking. Like your friends don't like you when you give up drinking because you become more boring because you're, you're not adding in this entertaining drama <laughs> all the time. But do you really want to live your life for other people's entertainment or do you want to live it, you know, you're living your life 24-7 and you want to be able to do it in a way that's, freeing and opening and allows you to achieve things in this kind of relaxed and easy way but um yeah i loved your example anthony of that i'm just picturing the little old lady art thief like she was going to try and steal the mona lisa or something <laughs> i mean you know the, the funny thing was that over the years i worked in that company for 14 years and i thereafter i used to see her sort of you know probably five or six times a year and um you know you probably know that silver well certainly jewelry dealers um you know they carry millions of pounds worth or dollars worth of stones just in their pockets you know it's they're not walking around with a sort of briefcase handcuffed to their wrist you know you would never know that in, and this woman you know she just looked like a bag lady but in all those old bags was you know, hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of really great silver. But, you know, nobody would give her a second glance. In fact, they probably crossed the road to avoid her. You know, that taught me a very good lesson that, and particularly working in that business where, you know, we were dealing with very, very valuable things. And, you know, if you saw somebody come in wearing a tailor-made suit and beautiful shoes and, you know, they look very stylish, you may have been led to believe that, you know, they were very wealthy and that they were very important. And then, of course, I suppose by, you know, the mid-80s, 
the really, really wealthy people were looking very different. You know, they were just wearing an interesting T-shirt and, you know, perhaps their, their trainers were 700 pound, you know, Gucci trainers. But, you know, they didn't stand out. They looked a little bit like everybody else. And, you know, today it's, it's, you don't get those obvious markers um, determined by, by people's um, dress or appearance. You know, I mean, some people are deliberately making themselves look smart when they haven't actually, you know, there's nothing there. Um, and then the reverse happens. People dress down, um, you know, just so they can blend in. And so I think, uh, you know, that taught me a very valuable lesson, um, you know, not to judge a book by its cover, that old fashioned saying, you know, which is just wait. I, I, I mean, just to piggyback off that a little bit more too, when I think about perception and the growth of my perception, what I think it allows us all to do is give people the benefit of the doubt a little bit more. You know, so if you are skeptical about what a person's intention is, especially if they're relating to you, if they're accosting you, if it's the first time they're meeting with you or there's something going on, you know, a smaller sense of perception, you might feel attacked and you might feel defensive and that you have, this person is doing this particular thing. And with a greater sense of perception, you're, you're kind of going, wait, maybe it's not what I think. Maybe it's something else is going on. X, Y, and Z is at play. And if I consider that, then maybe I can really see more clearly what's going on and how to better behave. And, you know, what's interesting, I think, of what's going on in the world right now with all of these things that, you know, are coming to the surface, especially when it comes to our appearance and how we're perceived because of the color of our skin or whatnot. You know, what I'm hoping comes out of this and what I've learned for myself too is to give people the benefit of the doubt, you know, and that we oftentimes are seeing people at a very stressful moment, you know, maybe when they're not at their best. And that's, that's just a part of the picture. So if, my, if I have a larger perception or the way that I perceive the world for myself, then that also includes the way that I perceive how other people perceive the world as well. And it, it gets so interesting because, I've, Anthony, what you said at the end of your story was about how we see the world as being infinite and what a different dynamic that brings to behavior. You know. I can't stop thinking about how, how much your perception influences your behavior, what you're thinking about, how you're perceiving things at that moment, you know, directly correlated to how you're going to respond. And I felt, you know, from, from most of my life growing up that I was kind of taught, give people the benefit of the doubt. You know what I mean? And I couldn't always do that, but now, I feel like if, if I do that and if I have the wherewithal to do that, which I think I do much more now, then it opens me up to all these other possibilities that couldn't happen before. There's just going to be conflict. There's just going to be, oh, I don't want to engage with you. I don't want to listen to you. And then you walk away from that experience and then you start to make all these other assessments and judgments about the person and what could have happened. And so... I'm, I'm hopeful that, you know, the conversations that we're having around perception and whatnot, you know, are relevant for this time so that we can all start gaining a larger perception of how we are all one race and how we're connected and that we're not so different from each other. And that's one of the beautiful things about, you know, being alive and being a human in the world. Yeah, I think that's, a really important point, Derek. So yeah, one of the things that we talk about about meditation is that we um, improve our perceptive powers and we make it more subtle. So we're able to perceive more levels of subtlety. And I think that's really key in, in this time with, with the Black Lives Matter debate. There's always, <clears throat> well, with any of these big debates, it's really easy to, for there to be polarization. And there's like, all cops are murderers and all protesters are looters and there's this kind of 
polarization, which which you know links into my thing about in my diary, I would often have enemies because it's I think when you're when you have a reduced perception, you try and make things easier by putting things in box boxes and saying, right, this is good, this is bad, you know, this is right wing, this is left wing. I'm gonna leave them in their boxes. And that leads to these more oppositional standpoints. And then, like you said, Derek, it's like you go, right, I'm going to read all these bad things into you because I've put you on that side. Whereas nothing is is that people don't live in these boxes. It's, it's a, a full spectrum of subtlety. And as we meditate, we, we can more easily perceive that that subtlety, which means that we can stay open to things and and more fully engage um, and resist the urge to fall on one side of any debates because the more we we um, pigeonhole people and say oh no you're this you're this you're always this you're always that just means that 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 makes them more polarizing more polarized and then everything becomes more confrontational and as you say like we when we meditate we recognize that there's this unity below everything and it's just how we can act to to make that more of a reality but interesting times indeed they are i think i think it's it's interesting how when you pigeonhole people whatever they do kind of lives up to your expectation of what somebody would do if they had that label attached to them Mm -hmm. so that you're not looking for the for the exceptional behavior you're looking for the typical behavior Mm -hmm. and it's these these subtleties and nuances which we we start to pick up on which which you have both both mentioned and i think it's a little bit like sort of it's a little bit like radar or an x-ray that you know we're able to see beyond the face value, you know, or what we immediately see, that the subtleties and the nuances are there. And the things like skin colour or language or accent or the way you're dressed or the way you're behaving because you're stressed, as you said, Derek, you know, all these things, we peel that all away, we melt that all away because that's not the real person. That's, that's in a sense, the covering. And we peel that all away and we, with our x-ray vision, if you like, we get right into something much more interesting. And what we're, I think, you know, what we're doing is we're actually seeing ourselves Mm -hmm. in that other person. Once we peeled away all the obvious differences, all the obvious otherness, and then there's something really beautiful because there's a connection. And if the other person I mean, so often you can melt people, you can melt their hearts by making the first move and just treating them with respect and with humanity and with compassion. And you're 90% of the way there. Now, they may be treating you very suspiciously because they think, you know, what the hell, what the hell, you know, what's going on? Um, But if, you know, if they are open to some sort of relationship, some sort of connection, you're going to get there. You're going to make it so much easier for them by being able to step beyond the, the kind of the halfway mark, going considerably, considerably beyond that mark. And, um, you know, I think when you see groups of uh, meditators together, you know, obviously there's a, common, there's a, there's, there's a commonality. We we're all sharing a, a particular uh, technique. But, you know, there's a wide spectrum of people who normally, you know, when you look around, Somebody would say, well, who, who are all these people? I can't see a sort of common theme to them. Are they, they're not all obviously scientists or students or, you know, rocker. You know, what is it? What's the common theme? And it's not apparent, you know, initially until you start talking to a group of Vedic meditators. And then you realize, well, actually, these people are very sweet. You know, they're, they're very open-minded, open-hearted and, um, you know, are going to give you the benefit of the doubt. And I think like another important thing about that is that it allows us to have more of that introspection and be less rigidly attached to, to things that we've, we've done before. So, you know, at the moment it's, it's, it's looking back and, you know, trying to think of where have I held these biases or, or perceptions before that I didn't really notice it. Cause I think that, that one of the ideas is that 
with this is that there's this baked in bias bias towards people of color and you know things that you do unconsciously that we need to re-examine and i think as meditators we're in a better position to do that because we're we're not as attached to to how we were in the past because we've changed we've already changed so much as meditators um so it puts us yeah we're yeah we're more easily able to examine you know where we may have been at fault in the past and not and not have the guilt and shame to just deny it and keep going we, we can we can shine the light of awareness on it and that will help it move away you know i in this time especially last week i we've all been flooded with different images and there's been so much energy that's going on and I've struggled with, you know, what's the right thing to say or what's the right thing to do or behave, especially because it feels like it's in a very um, narrow part of the spectrum where everyone's operating very close to each other, seeing just what's in front of them. And I felt like I couldn't, I couldn't really operate in that space. And so what I've done instead is to zoom out, is just is zoom out as far as you can and try to really stand back. And from that space, I've been able to, one, remember, okay, there's something much larger at play here, and that is this illusion of other. Don't forget that, you know? And part of it is when you're zoomed in is that you're saying, okay, I know this is an illusion, but I'm really going to adopt it almost as it's real, you know? But at any time, if I want to, step way back and go, okay, this is... It looks like we're other people, but it's just one thing acting like other. And then after that, once I gain that perspective, I can come back and then engage with people or others, what appears to be others who don't have that perspective in a different way because I'm now reminded that the illusion is still going on and to what degree am I participating in it? And and it helps reassure me like everything's going to be okay because when you get really, really close, like I think of it like if I'm in a museum and I'm looking at a painting and I put my face up to the painting, I have my nose on the painting and I'm trying to describe what it is. Well, I can only really perceive a little bit because it's right here. And what does that mean to me? And how do I feel about all that is very different than when I step back, I get to see more of the picture, I step way back, and then I see the whole picture. I keep stepping further back, I see other people witnessing the picture. So then I can choose, okay, where am I gonna come back in and how am I going to relate to all of these things that are going on? And I'm still in the process of doing that, but I feel much more settled than I have before. Because there was this demand, it seemed like, what are you saying? What do you stand for? What action are you taking? Say this and all this kind of stuff. And I was like, I need to zoom out for a minute. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I, I'm happy that I, I have because I realized too, this illusion and what's going on, it's necessary, you know? And there's this part of how nature and the universe progresses in this manner. And this is what's going on constantly. I, you know, I'm not here to stop it. I'm here to participate in it, but I could see getting swept up and caught up. And there was a little bit of that pull for me to get caught up in it all. And I was like, no, I don't, this is, this is me just being really, really close. And so now I just think of it as like, you know, I have my perceptions like a camera. I can zoom in and I can zoom out to whatever degree serves me and that that's 100 percent meditation <laughs> doing that i think you using the um analogy of a painting is very interesting because you know when you do get up close to the canvas or the surface of, of, of the picture you can see how it's made up you know that there are little strokes of this paint or maybe there's some some other material that's been added and so you get right down into the kind of minutiae of its construction. And then you realize that there are all these little subtleties, all these little things that, you know, even if you put two colors next door to each other, 
for example, if you put blue and orange next door to each other, there is a well-known kind of uh, dynamic in the way that those two colors are then perceived, that they kind of, one color offsets the other, it kind of charges it up. And then of course, when you pull back, you might not actually see those two little colors sitting side by side, you see something bigger. And I think one of the issues that we've got at the moment is that there are many, many different undercurrents to all these major things that are going on. There are many different agendas. There are many different um, policies in place. Um, there are different groups of people coming in, some with good intentions, some with not good intentions. And I think, it's, as you say, it's very easy to get swept up into that. There's the tug and the pull. Your friends are doing this. People are saying, hey, you know, where do you stand on this? You've got to say something. And I think you can get swept up into something which then becomes uncontrollable. And I think we've all seen on social media people who've perhaps just used the wrong one wrong word or the tone of what they're saying is not so great. And, you know, suddenly it's not looking so good. And they've contributed actually to something which, you know, has turned out completely opposite to what they intended. Yeah. And so I agree. I think standing back is, you know, I, th I think we, we have some senior teachers who say, you know, when in doubt, just keep your mouth shut. <laughs> and it's such good advice because, you know, we're, we're all encouraged to speak up and make a contribution and you know write something and record something and put something out and it's very easy to do it it takes it takes very little time um but just taking the more considered view the macro view um, i think has a lot of merit it's it's interesting what you say there um especially with the writ written form because i was thinking this before when um, when you were saying like when you go up to someone and you you open up to them and you just have a chat on on the level then people <clears throat> it's easy to get people on side but I remember this from from work and I've got a rule at work which is like if something's getting heated over email take it off email immediately because if you write anything in an email and they're in a negative frame of mind they're going to misread anything that they possibly can into mm. that and then be like, oh, I can't believe you said that. They'll be reading a, a snarky tone, even though you didn't have one, all those things. And that's, I guess, the same in this heightened debate at the moment. Whatever you write can be taken out of context because you're not, you know, when we talk in person, when we talk um, physically, you can, you can read people's body language and you can kind of get, get their vibe. Whereas in the written form, it's much more easy to, to be overtaken by what your point of view is and then read read stuff into it, which, you know, just increases the debate. And then you get these, you know, horrible uh, arguments where, where from an outside you go, well, hang on, you you don't have that dissimilar view, but you've both kind of read the worst thing into what the other person said. So mm. even whenever I see that at work and it's like a group email and it's going back and forth, it's like, look, just stop this at least get on the phone because as soon as you're on the phone it's like oh yeah yeah sorry i thought you meant that but no no um and yeah and sometimes it is better to just n not say anything or definitely not say anything written down because it can be perceived because i guess what we all we all think oh it's easy for us to think that there's this objective reality out there but we're all coming from very relative positions we've all had different upbringings and we're sitting in different places and we've just, we've, our context is different. Like we may have just read something else, which has made us think slightly differently. And, but we kind of have this idea that there's this objective reality out there. But I think through meditation, you realize more that you are coming from a specific place and someone else is, and you're not arguing over this one set objective reality, but that we're all bringing our own biases. And I think, knowing that is the first step to, to change because that makes you stop before you say something and go, well, hang on, let me just, you know, flip the camera around a bit. I think it's interesting how people also want to perpetuate a sort of binary situation. 
you know that that you know that it's in their interests to ensure that there is otherness maintained. Mm. Mm. Um, I guess that's that's one of the the positives that will come out of this current time is that we will start re-examining stuff and we'll start changing our perception of 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 events that happen, but also people. You know, this thing that's happening in the UK a lot at the moment and in the US is the re-looking at who the, the statues of all the people we have standing up. So, you know, in my hometown of Bristol, they pulled down a statue of Edward Colston, who was who was they put a statue up because he's this local philanthropist, but campaigners have been trying to get it pulled down because that money came from the slave trade and he was the director of this huge slaving company that that transported 80,000 people from Africa to the New World. And I guess histories are great because we were talking about there's this, this relative, we're all subjective and relative, but then we have this illusion that there's an objective reality and history is a great example of that because it's, you know, they always say the victor is the one who writes the history book. And then it's as if, no, this, this was the history, but you know, we can change history all the time. And I think there's, there's a big debate in the UK at the moment about bringing more black history into, into the curriculum, because if, if, as we were saying, like our biases are, partly to do with our, our nurture and our upbringing, then if we can change that from an earlier age and give people more of a rounded um, idea of what, what happened and see from everyone's point of view, then hopefully we'll have less less of these polarizations in the future and less less of these terrible, you know, atrocities happening. Well, the interesting question that I've been asked over the past couple of weeks, even by my mother and by family members is, have you been a victim of racism? And it's such an interesting question. And again, I didn't know how to engage in it when it first was asked to me. And by stepping back and gaining a little bit more perception, I came to, well, I wouldn't consider that I've been a victim of it because it makes it sound as though it's happening to me and I don't have a choice over it and there's people to blame. So have I been subjected to it? Yes, but I, I, I don't like to use that word victim because there are people who I love and I care about very deeply who, because of the way they were brought up, see the world differently than I do and are vocal about that. And I have no ill will against them. You know, I, 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 don't, I don't want to finger point and go, oh my God, what you just said is so racist and all these kind of things. Because again, they're operating from their state of consciousness and their perception and what they know and all the things that we talked about that are subtle and aren't overt and explicit. And, you know, again, I want to give them the benefit of the doubt. I want to give everybody the benefit of the doubt. And I think the other part of that is, you know, when you were saying, you know, the victors write the history. Absolutely. And so I would like to see myself as a victor of racism, not a victim of racism. Okay, thank you for watching till the end. Each episode, we offer a takeaway, a practical exercise you can do at home to apply this knowledge to your own life. In this episode, we were talking about perception and how we're able to see things more clearly when we've cleared our perceptual filters. This week, your task is to see the world through other people's eyes, to try to see from someone else's perspective. You can approach this any way you like. But how about reading the news from a different news source, perhaps one you would never have thought to read before? Or read a book by an author whose background or viewpoint is very different from your own. Rather than judging their viewpoint, just see what things are like through their eyes. 
If you're happy to share your stories, we'd love to hear them and for you to join the conversation. Please send them through to us at stories at the Vedic Conversation.com or post them on social media with the hashtag the Vedic Conversation. If you've enjoyed this episode, please share it with your followers and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you next time.